So hello everyone again. My name is Julia. Glad to see you're all here. And let's start. My topic today is why can developers make it secure? And before we begin, let me quickly present myself. Uh, again, my name is Julia. This is my Twitter account. You can follow me, ask me different questions. You can tell me your thoughts about my talk later. And also, I will share my slides here so you can follow me. Uh, I am a security software engineer at Cossack Labs. Uh, we are a security and uh, data security and cryptography company. We work with different platforms, uh, different languages. Our, our products are for different platforms and different languages. And my personal specialization is mobile application security. Because, well, yeah, I'm a former mobile application developer. Yeah, and my topic is why can developers make it secure? So I know what it feels like to be asked this question. Uh, if you ask developers what is the problem, what will they answer? Uh, let's stop here for just a quick moment and I'd like you to think about the answer and maybe share your thoughts uh, in uh, Zoom and on YouTube. I think it will be an interesting for us to go through at the end and see if we are aligned on this topic. And I will share my thoughts with you as well. Uh, okay. Um, I think that the most common answers would be that Developers just have no time for security. They have very tight deadlines and features usually have, have um, much higher priority than security, than security controls. Uh, but, you know, it's just a tip of uh, the iceberg. This thing uh, on the left represents an iceberg. Uh, and, you know, icebergs, they are much larger than it seems from the beginning. Uh, if you give developers more time for security, if you set higher priority for security controls to be implemented, you will still have some problems because, uh, because uh, you uh, will see that your team lacks uh, security expertise. You will see that uh, some security controls are in conflict with other features. And if we look a little bit closer, we'll see that the second item is usually the result of lack of a secure architecture. And our iceberg is getting even bigger. Uh, I hope we are aligned on this part. If not, I will be glad to see your thoughts uh, in chat. Uh, and for now, I want to share some interesting statistics with you. Uh, you know, some companies uh, survey C-level executives like CTO, CISO and others and ask them different questions about uh, security. Uh, some reports may not be of the very high quality, but still they're pretty interesting to look at. Uh, regarding tight deadlines, you see 58% uh, say that release deadlines are often too tight to properly implement security controls. This survey is uh, for mobile applications. And I think it's pretty realistic, right? Uh, from the same survey regarding security controls being in conflict with other features, 63% uh, agrees that there is often a lack of alignment between departments to align user-facing features and security controls implementation. And a very sad statistics lower that only 25% uh, of respondents are fully aware of changes made to in-house applications and APIs within their software development environment. So no one knows everything. Communication uh, is essential here for security. A little bit more numbers uh, about lack of security expertise and no uh, secure coding skills. Uh, just 32% have confidence that uh, they uh, could secure sensitive data. This is a little bit sad. They will probably need to hire an external security team or some other experts. 61% uh, of uh, applications had at least one critical and high issue not covered by OWASP top 10. So you see, 
uh, very, very basic knowledge is not enough. Like OVASP, uh, knowing OVASP top 10 and checking for OVASP top 10 vulnerabilities is not enough to build secure system, secure product. It's way too basic. And like, it's just for web. 57% uh, do not inspect uh, data that is being transferred, returned via APIs. That is not good. It's one of the very basic secure coding things, you know, uh, and uh, this piece uh, uh, of text at the right top corner says that vulnerabilities caused by lack of secure coding are not very common in general, but they are very dense. Uh, it means that not many apps have such issues, but if they have, then they have a lot, a lot of vulnerabilities related to it. So it has very, very high density. Uh, as I've started with secure coding, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about it. Uh, you know, secure coding uh, is like a separate skill. Developers learn it as any other skill. It does not come by the default. There are general best practices and platform specific recommendations to learn. And well, in the perfect world, in the perfect world, uh, your organization has a security training to teach these secure coding skills, not just how to detect phishing emails, uh, but there are uh, other options for self-education, for self-education, self uh, like online materials, like, uh, for example, like OVASP materials. Uh, there are security conferences to attend, like today's one, uh, or there are also some uh, platform-specific conferences that may be also useful to gain secure coding skills. Uh, here, just for the sake of example, I've listed some basic uh, general secure co coding principles. There are many, many more, but I hope that if developers are watching me right now, they know these three very well. Uh, the first one is uh, data minimization principle that you do not, uh, that you store only data that you really need. Uh, you know, if the API, if your backend returns you uh, a lot, a lot of data, it doesn't mean that you need to store everything. You store just what you actually need. So this, uh, this is one of the very basic principle, principles of secure coding. The second one listed here is uh, uh, validate any input from external sources. Yeah, we said, uh, we saw uh, sad statistics about it. Uh, you need to validate any input from the user, from network requests for any API calls and so on, so on. And uh, everything you get from the database and so on. Uh, and the third one listed here is uh, deny access by the default. Um, you know, like a very straightforward example is that uh, if uh, authorization request fails, uh, you do not uh, give the user the author uh, authorization rights. Uh, like if password validation fails, you do not allow user to proceed. It's pretty straightforward example. Uh, but another example um, I saw uh, in a real project is like uh, the, the application was uh, showing an image and applying watermark on it. Uh, and to get an image, uh, it has a it had a separate request to get an image and a separate request to get a watermark, and then it put it all together. And it was funny that uh, if the request for watermark fails, then the application showed uh, an image with no watermark, and that's it. It's a nice example where uh, the developers didn't thought about the third principle. Uh, okay, so secure coding is uh, just a small part of what we need to build secure product. And uh, this is a typical software development lifecycle. I hope uh, everyone here is familiar what, uh, with what it is. Uh, yeah, we have here requirements definition, design phase, development, testing, deployment, and repeat, repeat, repeat. And if we add secure coding, it will be somewhere here during development phase. 
Uh, but you see, it is uh, not enough. A lot of things are not covered. And uh, the truth is that usually those parts may not be covered at all. Uh, usually, well, it's pretty often case that security is postponed like a last minute feature and such attitude is not good. Uh, we want security to be in the core of our system, not to be added as a last minute thing, you know, like we want it like inside the core. Uh, and, you know, uh, if security is so important, why do we postpone it? What is the problem? Because security is not visible. Usually it has no direct business value. Uh, it is not something you can sell. You can sell nice features, but not security. And basic security stuff is usually supposed to be there by the default. And uh, you can't see if it's actually working. Uh, you can only see when it fails. Monitoring is nice, but actual incidents are much, much more visible for the whole company, for your management team, for business owners. Uh, if security is not built in, into our core and if security is the last minute feature, and the more we delay security, the more effort it takes to be added and the more chances it has to be ignored at all. Another interesting statistic related to it. Uh, usually uh, it happens with issues and tasks that require significant changes for multiple platforms, for architecture, like big, big changes. Uh, the longer it takes to fix an issue, the less chances it has to be fixed. Uh, you can see here in this uh, uh, report this, that uh, Black Text saying that uh, while many flows are being addressed promptly, older flows uh, tend to linger over time. That one in four flows remain open after a year and a half. That is very sad. And uh, this graph also, uh, uh, works nicely for an example with penetration testing that is done, uh, uh, for example, with, uh, for example, with penetration testing, uh, because um, many companies uh, do not address security during development. Uh, they just order uh, external penetration testing uh, when everything is ready and deployed. And uh, they get reports with found some issues, uh, they fix low hanging fruits and that's it. Everything else that requires like complex changes, big changes uh, is postponed for later or just ignored forever. And we don't want that to happen. We want to have security in the core of the product. And uh, as a result, we'll have less issues find, found by pen testers and less problems fixing these issues. Uh, we want to address security on each step, not just during development uh, or after the very final deployment, you know? Uh, so. Uh, here is what a secure software development lifecycle may look like. It's just one of the visions. You can find a lot of different schemes for that. Uh, it is very close to what I do as a part of external security team. So during the phase of requirements definition, uh, we uh, assess risks. During design, we do threat modeling and design review. During development, we watch for uh, secure coding skills of the developers. Uh, we have some static analyzers integrated. Uh, during test phase, so we do code review, uh, security testing. And uh, after deployment, we have again penetration testing and we watch for secure configuration. Uh, security team can assist dev team on each step. Uh, they help during every, every step here, like they help during risk assessment, threat modeling, design review, like on each iteration. If new feature appears, uh, it requires like another security review. So it's not something that you've done at the very beginning and that's it, you do it on each, each iteration. 
uh, during development phase, uh, we may also have, as I mentioned, different security trainings like uh, secure coding trainings. Uh, during testing phase, uh, development team together with security team can um, create a different useful documentation, for example, security checklist, security test cases, and uh, feature description from a security perspective. You know, not a report with found bugs, but the report that describes your feature from a security perspective, like how it works, what is important here. And then, yeah, then deployment and external uh, internal penetration testing. Uh, and you see uh, there are um, much more actors in this process than just developers. Actually, developers usually take, uh, take care of this small part. And uh, an important thing to understand here is that architectural decisions are usually made here, not during design and development, but during requirements definition and design. Uh, so developers do not cover everything. So I mentioned at the beginning uh, that developers can't make it secure because of lack of secure architecture. So let's try to figure it out what the problem is and how to fix it. Uh, there is a lot of pressure in the fast pacing environment and people make poor decisions under the pressure and secure architecture is about decision making. People mess up processes under pressure and secure architecture is about following the process. So isn't it a typical responsibility for developers like to build a secure architecture? I think it's a pretty common answer. So. We'll try to answer it and first of all, we'll give a definition to secure architecture. A secure architecture is a combination of structural security decisions. Uh, if we were talking about just architecture, general architecture, we would say that it is a combination of structural decisions. And as we are adding security here, we are saying that it is a combination of structural security decisions that efficiently addresses risks. Like our main goal here is to address risks. Considering uh, business goals, we don't need security for the sake of security. We don't want uh, to break key features for sake of security. Mm, we want to look for trade-offs that will satisfy both build business goals and address risks. Okay, uh, you see there is a significant difference uh, between secure architecture and secure coding. Uh, secure architecture is an abstraction. It is about decision-making process. It is based on risks and business goals. And secure coding is platform specific. It's about writing code. It is about following uh, it is about following industry guidelines and best practices. Uh, secure architecture, when you work on secure architecture, you operate risks and business goals abstracting from the tools. And when you do secure coding, you are actually operating the tools. You do not make any business decisions. So secure architecture is about creating structure, while secure coding is about adding some details. Uh, okay, uh, building secure ar architecture, what it looks like. First step, uh, we define business goals. Like we were talking a lot about business goals, so here we define them. Uh, and we need business people involved for it. Like main people, uh, main actors for these steps are business people like business owners or their representatives. Uh, second step, uh, based on business goals, so the team defines risks, measure risks, look for trade-offs. Then when risk assessment is ready, we can work on threat model, decide what security controls we need, uh, what is the priority of, for each of them, how do we need to implement them and so on. 
And then on the next step, we are actually implemented all of this. Uh, you see, um, business owners are usually involved mainly during uh, defining business goals and risk assessment and a little bit uh, on the phase of um, decision making and design, while dev team is more involved during decision making and uh, building the architecture and a little bit less involved uh, during a risk assessment. Uh, sometimes it works as is. Um, but it helps uh, to involve uh, security team because, you know, communication between business owners and dev team, it's uh, really, really tough sometimes. So we are adding security experts here. And so then if you still see that things are not moving properly, you probably want your security team to be involved on each step like that. Uh, and each step of building secure architecture and, of course, each step of uh, secure software development lifecycle. Uh, it shows uh, the importance uh, of the team communication and shared responsibility. Uh, I would like to talk more about shared responsibility and ownership. Uh, because like no one knows everything. We always need a person to ask questions. We always need to know who is making decisions for each, uh, let's call them domains. Uh, when you design secure architecture, you'd want, uh, you'd want to uh, know the opinion from each domain. Uh, I mean, from like, business owners, product project managers, software developers, UI UX designers, DevOps team, QA engineers, and so on, so on. And probably the best example here, apart from security, uh, is QA engineers. They usually are not involved in decision-making and architecture design. However, as a result, uh, they may not be able to automate some flows. Uh, Eden, uh, like and we, if we add um, security to this example, uh, for example, um, some applications have bot detection, um, malicious user detection, uh, and your automated tests, like uh, UI tests, are very very similar to bots. And if you do not plan such case in advance, you won't be able to automate it properly. And you know, adding a Boolean flag is prod or is test is also a bad decision. So you should think in advance how, uh, how to make this feature work and how to test it. Uh, that's why even QA team should be mm, involved in the initial uh, architecture design. Uh, and you see it is uh, uh, everything, all of this is a part of our security of security of our system. And each team is responsible for uh, its uh, own domain. So they need to raise uh, these questions and they uh, need to have some expertise in these questions. Uh, and when we talk about software developers, we should understand that each platform is also different. Uh, secure architecture requires expertise like in each platform. Uh, for example, uh, a force upgrade feature. Uh, unlike web, you cannot control the user updates on desktop and mobile applications unless you have implemented additional feature for that. The front-end developer may be absolutely not aware that the app needs a specific feature for that. Like for web, you just update your website and it works with the new version. But it doesn't work that way for desktop and mobile applications. Uh, what is more, the feature requires backend changes, and backend developers may also be absolutely not aware that they need to do something to make your application more secure. So the uh, application team uh, needs to tell them, like it, uh, they need to communicate. Another example. Uh, imagine a website for sharing some secret corporate images uh, like schemes, diagrams, and so on. Uh, and then uh, imagine they have an Android application and the security expert tells you that you need to have a screenshot prevention for the Android app. 
you ask why would I need that? Users can easily make a screenshot like from the web on their desktop. What what why do I need it for Android? Why do I need to prevent screenshots? Uh, but Android devices are different. Uh, usually users um, sync their photos, including screenshots with Google Photos or with iCloud. And uh, sometimes they share their images with family members. Uh, sorry. Uh, so uh, they may accidentally share some corporate secrets with their family members and that is not good and you see there is huge difference between two platforms uh, there are very different attack vectors that's why you need expertise in each each platform you have next uh, i have already mentioned ownership and i want to talk a little bit more i like this phrase that uh, if you own you care I like it because uh, ownership can be like natural and assigned. Natural ownership is when you do your job and you care, you just naturally care for what you do. And assigned ownership is like you are assigned to take care of this or that part. Like it's your job, you are assigned to do that. So if you own, you care. As for me, Ownership uh, in software development process means that you understand your role, you know uh, what you are doing and what for, and you communicate these to others. Remember, our goal here is uh, that each member knows uh, who to ask questions. And the person who owns some part of the system, some part of the project, uh, is a person who you can address questions to. Uh, for example, it's an example of natural ownership. Like, uh, like uh, let's say uh, a personal characteristics you may look uh, for when you hire developers. Uh, what it feels like to own a feature. Like you understand the real business value of the feature you are implementing. Uh, so you you just take closer looks, take closer look uh, at related PRs to this feature that you've um, implemented. Like it's your own feature, you take care of it. You want to see how it changes. Uh, you keep an eye on updates, and you are re uh, ready to speak up if you see that some other feature may break feature you implemented. So it's natural ownership when you take care about your work. And another example of ownership, I like it a lot because it works both for natural ownership and for assigned ownership, reading security documentation. Like, uh, if you have implemented a security feature, you may be just, uh, you may just feel the ownership, natural ownership of it. So you are interested uh, in reading security documentation because you, are ju you just care for what you are doing. So you just go and read. From the other side, uh, if it is an assigned ownership, if you are assigned to take care of this security feature, you, it's just your job to go and read the documentation. So both cases can work here. You can just assign a person to do that or you just may be lucky and someone is already doing that. So uh, to sum up everything that was said about secure architecture, uh, secure architecture requires security expertise, processes, shared responsibility and ownership. And back, back to the very first question. Uh, why can developers make it secure? Like, because, because of this list, because there is lack of security expertise, lack of processes, lack of shared responsibility and lack of ownership. Uh, you know, uh, these things, they do not appear on their own. You need to work on them. Uh, some teams are able to set everything up on their own 
at least they will have enough security for the current moment for their business goals like for the current state of what they have they are okay uh, we don't know what will they need in the future but many teams require help and they just hire internal or external security teams uh, here i have gathered some useful links uh, the first one is a talk from the infoq about and secure architecture. Actually, this talk was an, an inspiration for my talk, so I recommend it a lot. Uh, and uh, the second one is about uh, secure software development lifecycle. Uh, here is a, uh, it is a video of one of this talk and the presentation. And also, I have mentioned two links uh, to this interesting statistics about data security and application uh, security so you can take a look and see some interesting numbers so generally that is it from me again here is my twitter account i will post my slides here as well and i think we can proceed to questions and see if there were any interesting answers in the chat thank you Julia, what did I miss? There was a quiz I could win? No, I, I asked uh, what I the couldn't. audience think about, <laughs> about why can developers actually make it secure? Ah, maybe they that. have, okay. yeah, maybe they have give some you my interesting answer. thoughts. Go I ahead. I can give you my answer, but ah, uh, you know, you know it. It's all about, you know, I'm Marxist by heart. So it's all about economic incentive for me. Uh, we do not pay them for security. We pay them for features. Yeah, features are visible. Features are useful. Security basically is not visible, and uh, yeah, is not useful until until something bad happens. You know, like plumber. You never need a plumber until you really need a plumber. You know. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Or like extinguisher, <laughs> the same example. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the same same thing. It's, it's it hangs around in the corner. You never need it. It just it, it just you know ruins your selfies. Yeah, you, you have a yeah. background for a really nice selfie, and there is a fire extinguisher. Why? Why on earth we need them? But when you need them, you really really need them. Okay, so what do we have as answers? Yeah, I think Nesta summarizes it very much. And I agree with her. We create secure by default software. It's a good <laughs> answer. <laughs> okay. A security is overvalued. Yeah, security is overrated, yeah. In this audience. <laughs> Nowhere else, though, but... <laughs> okay, 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 okay. We have some questions. We have some questions. To can, we can jump into questions. Let me just summarize uh, whether we have all of them here. Okay, yeah, we have. So, uh, uh, another excuse that uh, Anastasia has uh, highlighted. We don't have such ticket in Jira. That's, that's a universal answer, basically. Yeah, you wanted processes, you have them. <laughs> uh, and uh, a question. So thanks for the great presentation. Could you please suggest some training platforms that can be used by developers to improve their secure coding skills? In parentheses, something like Pentaster Lab code review challenges, HTB Academy modules related to secure coding. Mm. I can say that, uh, like, as for me, when I was a developer and I tried to learn some secure coding skills, I just browsed the internet, you know, and with no particular platform recommendations, and there were always something interesting to read. And uh, well, you know, uh, it's, it is all these articles online and courses online, they uh, like free courses online, they are about of the same quality. And uh, like 
actual trainings by security experts or actual like, live courses with a particular group of people is much more efficient. Like when you can ask some particular questions, when uh, like uh, it's important to like if you look for a uh, secure coding course for Java, you will not get a lot mm -hmm. of interesting information because there are a lot of users of Java and you probably need just a small piece of that. So probably it's better like to consult some, um, like to look for uh, specific courses, uh, like um, specific experts in this or that field who can give training to you, like a corporate training, because free courses, like they are just, uh, or just general online courses, they are just free, like free materials online. They're not of a very high quality, from my opinion. Do, what do you think about Secure Flag? Um, I haven't. Uh, I have no experience it. with it. <laughs> yeah, so uh, let me then maybe share this information. It's not free sure. at all, but uh, it's free when you are an OVS member, which is basically virtually free because for Ukraine it's 20 bucks per year. So you have access to Secure Flag that is basically, you know, like uh, Portswiggy Web Security Academy, but for source code analysis. So there are different uh portions of code in for different development uh, stacks and platforms and languages and you can basically interactively find bugs try to fix bugs and validate whether the fixes were uh, efficient and it, it looks better than anything i saw i would say so it's not perfect by any means but uh, it's really practical because it shows you the workflow how to review the code. And uh, I summarized it to myself as Grammarly for secure coding, you know, because as you use Grammarly, you, you, you gradually become a better writer yourself. Yeah, and you use Grammarly less and less. The same way, I suppose, people who develop software can use secure flag to, to like, become better, more secure developers. And, and then why, of course, it's an OS project. That's why <laughs> That's why I'm endorsing <laughs> for it. But, uh, but still, it, it's quite a good quality. Yeah, I suggest you look at that direction. Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting project. Uh, OK, other questions? We have one more. Uh, question if the developers will start to think about security will we lose our fancy security jobs oh no of course not <laughs> uh, <laughs> funny like <right? laughs> you know <laughs> just one person cannot know just everything and security is a huge thing you like a great example uh, is one of uh, i have multiple i had multiple projects uh, on react native and you know when you work on react native they they have just react native developers but these react native developers they need to know like react native they need to know uh, Android, they need to know iOS, and like they just have no chance to learn security on top of all of this. Like it's just way too much information for a single person. Uh, that's like that's why security people are here because it's just not possible to know everything. Another great example is cryptography. Like you, you can be a developer who knows it, but like to hire a good, let's say C++ developer with excellent cryptography knowledge, it's, uh, it's just almost not possible. You are very lucky to hire one when you need one. It's much easier to uh, hire uh, just a good developer and the security expert separately. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because I know like two of them and both of them would be really hard to hire. <laughs> Okay, okay. It's, uh, it's a good question, really. Thought provoking. Yeah, nice. So next one is, do you think GitHub Autopilot will improve security of our software? 
it obviously won't if you don't use GitHub, but uh, what chances are that uh, if you use GitHub, Autopilot will improve the security of the software? Like, again, I don't have experience with it. There are way too many tools in this world <laughs> to know how everything works. Uh, but uh, the, the general idea of putting some uh, security measures on the level of uh, basically it's it's sassed yeah so you use a platform like github or gitlab or bitbucket and they implement something that is available either as an option or by default right as they already do for um, for what for dependency checking right yeah but uh github is now microsoft and just starting from there, Microsoft has like access to a lot of coders and a lot of code. So maybe the right chances. Yeah. And, you know, uh, again, it covers just small parts. So small parts can be improved, but uh, main security flows like this part is easy to automate, not just with GitHub tools like with different tools and yeah you can automate some parts of the project uh, security check-in but there are still mm -hmm. a lot of parts that cannot be automated and like these uh, very painful flows are usually happen like in uh, error uh, related to errors in business logic or like some mm, architectural decisions not like using wrong method somewhere like it's something that is easy to detect something easy to fix and a lot of tools are all already helping with it mm -hmm. so maybe it will help with the technical vulnerabilities uh, i mean implementation level implementation level but not with the security flaws that are like design and architecture level for yeah sure. yeah because you still will need a human for that yeah okay any more questions if you want to grab the mic and ask questions out loud in our Zoom chat. Do it now or be silent forever. No questions. Or you can come to my next conference. <laughs> yeah, or catch up with Julia somewhere else because she is quite uh, an active contributor to Ukrainian cybersecurity scene. And we are all thankful for that, as uh, well as we are thankful for your presentation today. Thank you for being a part of No Name Con, and uh, good luck in your future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me.